My name is Katarzyna Kociołek and I'd like to welcome you very warmly at the beginning of this new exceptional academic year. When I was thinking about the topic of this mini lecture, I thought that perhaps it would be best to lead you gently from the holiday time to your first academic year. Following the latest COVID fashion for online traveling, I'd like to invite you for a virtual tour around the most scenic and beautiful places across the British Isles. At the same time, I'd like to introduce you to famous British and Irish visual artists for whom the beauty of nature became the essence of their art. These artists are John Constable, Paul Henry, Sean Keating and Richard Long. Before moving on to their paintings, I'd like to say a few words about how landscape is theorized by contemporary scholars. Dennis Cosgrove proposes not only to read landscape as a text, but also allows for diverse readings of the same space. Pointing to the intersection of landscape, culture and symbol, he observes that, quote, all landscapes carry symbolic meaning. End of quote. According to Cosgrove, the concept of landscape is a reminder of the people's relation to nature. Also, modifications of landscape often serve as powerful symbols of specific cultural values. So, for instance, Victorian parks located in English inner city areas, quote, still symbolize ideals of decency and propriety held by the Victorians, end of quote. As he traces the importance of landscape in history, Cosgrove also notes that the Renaissance invention of perspective contributed to the increasing popularity of landscape painting, which accompanied the accurate mapping of spaces. These, in turn, resulted in new conceptions about the world as orderly and structured. The meaningful sources of knowledge about the places, argues Cosgrove, include, quote, paintings, poems, novels, folk tales, music, film and song, end of quote. But today I'd like to focus on paintings and the visual art. Learning about new places is the easiest when you can travel, but when visiting places in person is not possible for some reason, for example, as recently due to the pandemic, images may become our only source of knowledge about even the most remote locations. With the popularity of the digital media, sending photographs from your holidays to your friends and relatives has become as natural as breathing. But obviously, back in the 18th and the 19th century, when traveling as a recreational activity was slowly but gradually gaining popularity, people could only paint rather than take a picture of a landscape that they particularly liked. When we realize this simple fact, we might change our thinking about all these landscape paintings, which actually many people find either boring or intimidating, or both boring and intimidating. John Constable was one of the pioneers of landscape art in Britain. In fact, he was also a pioneer of a new way of painting called plein air, uh, in French meaning outside, from which actually the Polish word plener originates. According to his contemporaries, landscape painting was hardly a suitable genre for ambitious and aspiring artists. Those who sought recognition as great artists in the 19th century were expected to paint historical paintings, portraits and copy the styles of the great Renaissance masters. Constable did none of these, and yet he has been regarded as the greatest British artist of all times. As a great admirer of nature, through his works, he wanted to promote the beauty of his native land. Unlike other artists of his time, he did not travel to the famous artistic destinations in the south of France or Italy in search of the themes for his works but he painted the rural landscape around the village in Suffolk in which he was born. 
Most importantly, he mastered the art of painting the sky in various weather conditions and instead of painting portraits of rich noblemen and their families, he painted portraits of trees <clears throat> so that in his works one oak can be distinguished from another. It soon turned out that his paintings accurately expressed the popular longing for the unspoiled beauty of the countryside which in the 19th century became threatened by rapid industrialization and urban development. While Constable's works have helped to consolidate the visual essence of Englishness around the countryside, in Ireland the remote Irish rural landscape became one of the pillars of a post-colonial sense of Irishness. Paul Henry one of the leading Irish landscape painters, like Constable, preferred portraying nature to people. Enchanted with the desolate landscapes of the western parts of Ireland, Connemara and Accio Island on the Atlantic Ocean, he chose to paint the areas that were least affected by British colonisation in order to restore the sense of Irish identity. In fact, Paul Henry's paintings representing remote landscapes of Connemara enjoyed such popularity that in the 1930s they were appropriated by the speedily developing tourist industry and turned into travel posters. Henry's attempt at decolonizing Irishness concentrated on the depictions of Ireland's western seashore with the artist taking as his subject matter the picturesque irregularities of the landscape characterized by both serenity and severity. Henry rarely painted human figures, choosing instead to portray tumultuous clouds hanging over the land or the sea. By doing so, he seemed to challenge the colonization of Ireland, where particularly in the cities, the British asserted their domination by exerting control over architecture and city planning and by erecting monuments in commemoration of their imperial heroes, such as Nelson's column unveiled in Dublin in 1808. Henry's depictions of the Irish wild nature might be viewed um, as countering the colonial projects of urban transformations aimed at turning Ireland into one of Britain's provinces. Henry's commitment to the representation of the area culturally and geographically remote to Dublin and so relatively unaffected by colonization might be seen as a deliberate search for the true sense of Irish identity. Another Irish artist who throughout his career was devoted to recording the historical developments leading to the consolidation of the Irish national identity was Sean Keating. Um, influenced by his wife's political activism in his paintings, Keating shows his devotion to political themes and imagery. His works were intended to um, as stated by his biographer Emer O'Connor, quote, encourage civic pride, end of quote, because he focuses on the daily heroism of common citizens and his choice of models clearly demonstrates his socialist principles. Um, in his landscape paintings, Keating seems to effectively challenge the colonizer's notion of manliness as a characteristic reserved for the English. He seems to supplement the newly imagined and forged Irish identity with the imagery of Irish man as the active makers and creators of the reality around them. This is metaphorically represented by a variety of jobs and tasks in which they're engaged and also by the setting of their mature or even aging bodies, implying such qualities as authority, experience and wisdom in the context of the Irish rural landscape. 
Keating seems to not only rewrite Ireland's history and establish new narratives of the national identity, but he also centers these narratives around the bodies of the Irish man whom he turns into the empowered heirs of the reclaimed territory. For example, in one of his paintings entitled The Port Authority, through its very title, he establishes a connection between the portrayed man and the concept of power expressed in the word authority. Emer O'Connor accentuates the fact that the man in the painting are active agents who are busy unloading the cargo in the port. In fact, they are so engrossed in their activities that none of them is uh, none of them are looking at the viewer. Landscape continues to play an important social and political function in art. Contemporary artistic practices labeled land art, like landscape painting, revolve around nature and landscape. One of the leading British representatives of the movement, Richard Long, for the last couple of decades has created projects that focus on nature and whose major theme is the relationship between people and the land. His walks, widely documented and photographed, which result in some minor transformations of the natural space, question the boundary between art and everyday life. By turning the mundane and banal act of walking into a visual art practice, Long clearly communicates that an artist is as if made in or by nature and that everybody can be or even is an artist. A line made by walking was created during one of Long's journeys from his home in Bristol to St. Martin. He stopped in a field and walked the path back and forth until a line was formed, which he later photographed. The work comments as much on human relation to nature as it does on impermanence and elusiveness of existence. It also neatly fits recent areas of research called environmental humanities, clearly corresponding to wider debates on ecology. I hope that this mini lecture might at least slightly change your perception of both landscape and land art and that maybe next time when you go for a walk you'll feel like an artist yourself. I also hope that whichever path you take in life as well as in your studies at the Institute it will lead you to many inspiring discoveries and to the most important discovery of all, which is the discovery of your true self. With best wishes, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Good luck.